Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we've got a beautiful Rolex GMT Master 2. This is a two-tone watch. That means that it's it's usually two metals. This one's gold and silver, which is what they usually are. This one belongs to a close friend of mine who asked me if I would check the battery on his Rolex for him. I <laughs> laughed. I think he was joking. I'm not 100% sure, but I told him absolutely. We'll get it running in tip-top condition because I want him to wear it. He doesn't always wear a wristwatch, and uh, this is a beautiful one that he's had for quite a while. This is a GMT-style watch, and as you can see, there's an, actually an extra hand in here, this big one with the big arrow on the end. That's an auxiliary hour hand, and these are for world travelers. These are for people that go to different time zones. Watch this. There's even a setting for the hand setting where you can set just the hour. See that? The hour jumps ahead by one hour per click. So when you land, let's say it's three hours over, you just go click, 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 the minutes and seconds stay the same and you're done. So that makes setting the new time easy and then you can rotate this 24 hour bezel around the outside to match up with the auxiliary hour hand to tell you what time it is at home. It lets you track two time zones at the same time. It's a really useful function if you travel a lot. As you can see, this is a really cool watch. It's got that black and gold with silver and it really kind of is a good statement piece. But he's had it for 15 plus years, maybe even longer. And it's never been serviced, so let's see how it's doing. We'll put it on the time grapher and see what kind of time it's keeping. All right, well, it looks like about, yeah, plus seven seconds a day, a little low on amplitude, beat airs out a little bit. That's about what you would expect for a watch that needs a service and hasn't been serviced before, so let's service it. We'll start off by removing the bracelet. I'm gonna use my bolt action spring bar tool. This is seriously like one of my favorite tools that I have. It's made by a guy on Instagram called Hassler Instruments. And it's just, it's one of the really cool things about watchmaking is the tools. And this is like kind of a really neat one. He makes these in his garage. Whoa, 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 whoa. The sticker still on this? Well, the protect, okay, this is crazy. There's a green sticker that has the reference number. And then there's a piece of plastic that it chips on. And my friend never took it off. Wow. I've never even seen that piece of plastic still on there. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna try to leave it on just because why mess it up, I guess, but that's crazy. Also, I gotta say, I'm one of those type of people that loves to peel that kind of thing off. So it's gonna take a little bit of will willpower for me to not do so, but at any rate, um, watch looks like it's in excellent condition, even, <laughs> with the protective plastic on it still somehow. But we do need to take the case back off of this thing. So I'm gonna have to use the big gun here. This is case back removal tool. So yeah, in order for me to do this, I do have to ooh, peel off this sticker and it feels so good, honestly, <laughs> to take that sticker off of there. I'll try to put it back on when I give it back to him just so it's in the same condition. But there's a special attachment for Rolex case backs. Yeah, I got a tool for that. And you need to use that specifically in order to take the back. You can see it's a has kind of a ridged back to it. And I'm gonna apply some pressure with the case back removal tool here. And then zzz, I can gently and carefully remove the case back. These are oyster cases, which is uh, Rolex's way of saying that they are uh, water resistant. And the way the water resistance works is quite simple, actually. It's two pieces of metal pressed together against a rubber seal. Ooh, take a look at the movement as we take off the case back. You can actually see the rubber seal around the edge there, too. And this is, of course, an automatic movement. Rolex calls it a perpetual. That's, that's their word for automatic. Oh, most companies just call it automatic, but some of them have some branding beyond that. We'll take off the, uh, the crown and the stem now. And you can see the movement is in absolutely beautiful condition, which of course is what you would expect. Rolex has come out of the movement back kind of an interesting way. You, you screw down these two screws and then you turn the movement about a quarter of a turn and then it just falls out the bottom like that. And you can see that's it, the movement's out. Rolex, they make really good watches. And I know that that sounds obvious. It's a freaking Rolex, right? Of course they make good watches, but they make really good watches. I mean, these things are so well built, so well thought out. I'm gonna line up the hands here. 
so that I can remove them. It just helps a little bit if you get them all kind of pointed in the same direction so you can get the hand levers under them. But yeah, Rolex makes really great watch, but they also do it in their own way. Like no other company does it that way where you turn the movement inside the case and then take it out. That's just not a thing that you see. And there's a few other things that you'll see as we tear apart the watch that are specific to Rolex. But I love the way they do things. They are, they're really an incredible company. Uh, you know, they make, uh, you know, over a million watches in the course of a year, which is a staggering number. And if you've ever worked in any field where something gets produced, manufactured, you'd know that the keeping the quality that high on a number that big is, is nearly impossible and they do it. Another interesting thing about Rolex, they're a nonprofit. They're not a profit for profit company, which is kind of weird, but that means that they're you know, privately ran nonprofit. They're not, you can't, you know, you can't buy shares in Rolex and it's kind of cool. It means that they get to do what they want. You know, when you're a publicly held company, you kind of have to play a different game, but when you're privately held nonprofit, you can do what you want. You know, that they could make a heck of a lot more watches and sell them if they wanted and they choose not to. Okay. So now we can remove the uh, calendar mechanism here. This is the the calendar ring. So this is of course the part that actually tells you what the date is. And I just have to move the little spring off to the side so that I can take the uh, calendar ring out. I'm actually just going to put it in a dial holder also just now. So it doesn't get dinged up while uh, I'm working on the rest of the watch. Now I can start by taking off the automatic winding works. Rolex was one of the very first companies to popularize and introduce a automatic mechanism. And as you can see, it's kind of a module. It sits on top of the movement and I can remove it all. Like it all just comes out. The, everything I'm taking off here is everything that makes up the automatic winding works. The rest of it is just a regular watch. You could even technically just use it without the automatic works if you wanted, but you would have to wind it up every day or every couple of days. Okay, we'll start off by letting down the mainspring. If there's any wind left in it from when we checked it on the time grapher, we need to make sure there's not. And you can see the balance wheel actually comes to a stop here as well. Now we can flip the movement over now that it's not running and continue with our disassembly. You can see there's three screws and interestingly, they made these blued, which is a uh, heat treatment process that you use on steel, but they did it this way so that the watchmaker would remember that those ones go on this plate on the outside and not anywhere else on the movement, which is another nice touch. Also, you'll note here as I start to get into it, how pretty the movement is, right? It's nicely decorated. You see that circular pattern that's repeated across the, the plates. That's done uh, by hand with the machine, if that makes sense. You have to move the movement and then pull a lever, and that's called perlage. And Rolex movements, believe it or not, are not known for being particularly beautiful. I find them a really nice mix of extraordinarily well built and well manufactured and also good looking like a nice looking movement but i'll tell you if you start to get into the higher end of watches and yeah if you're watching this and you thought rolex was the higher end of watches oh boy <laughs> this uh, rabbit hole goes a heck of a lot deeper than owning a rolex uh and the prices and quality actually go way way higher than this I think most people think of Rolex as being the best watch in the world, but uh, believe me, there there are uh, above. And you'll see that a lot of the, a lot of what people love about the brands that are even more expensive and prestigious than Rolex is the movement finishing. It's how it's finished. There's an art to it, where you apply these decorative elements, these where you polish, where you don't, how it's done, that determines a lot of the price of a watch. Rolex is kind of in the middle. They make them look nice, but they don't go crazy with it. 
Okay, now we can take off the, um, the balance bridge. That's two screws, and then we can loosen the bridge here and just remove the balance complete, as it's called. That's the bridge, the spring, the wheel itself, all of it. And it comes out nicely here. We'll just carefully set that aside. And we can continue with our disassembly. This is the ratchet wheel. The ratchet wheel is what ultimately gets turned when you either wind up the watch by hand, you know, using the crown, or when the automatic winding works turns around. And this is kind of an intermediary wheel that allows you to use one or the other. And we'll just remove it now. Again, other watches don't use a part like this. This is a Rolex thing. Now we can take off the train wheel bridge. This is my first time working on this particular movement, so there's always little quirks and things about it that you have to learn as you go. But if you work on movements from the same company over and over, you definitely see similarities. Kind of a hidden screw here. I'm also using my brass tweezers for the disassembly here. They're a little softer than steel, so they have less of a chance of leaving a mark on the metal. For a watch this nice, you know, I'm, I'm more concerned about that. I want to return this to my friend in the same condition that he handed it over to me in. All right, we can take out the train of wheels now. And now we can remove the barrel bridge as this thing's coming apart pretty reasonably. Fully jeweled movement here as well. That means that anytime there's a bearing where it's gonna be metal on metal, the watchmaker or watch manufacturer has the option to put a jewel in that spot, which is made out of synthetic ruby, which is much, much harder than steel and provides a really great flat bearing surface. But it does cost more. Not because of the jewels, believe it or not. You'd think, oh, you hear ruby and you're like, oh boy. No, these are synthetic rubies and synthetic rubies actually very easy to manufacture. They're very cheap for what you would think. Now these are to very specific tolerances. So, you know, companies like Rolex are gonna have to pay a bit more to get them exactly perfect like this. But even then, it's not about the jewel cost as far as uh, precious jewels go. Um, it's more about the manufacturing, the extra steps that it takes, uh, that kind of thing. But in a movement like this, they spare no expense. Uh, you'll see jewels in places that you don't normally see them. The bottom of your screen there, you can see a big one in the middle of that circle. That's the barrel bridge. Usually that's just metal on metal because it turns so slowly but here with the Rolex, there's a jewel there. Continuing the disassembly, I can take off the pallet fork bridge and the pallet fork underneath now that I've got all the wheels out. And there's kind of a growing pile of parts here on my bench. <laughs> this watch actually has kind of a lot going on. And there's one more little bridge here. This isn't you don't see this on other movements, so I don't know what this is called, but it seems to be holding down the uh, the crown wheel and the part of the keyless works there. So I don't know, crown wheel bridge maybe? Oh, and then underneath it actually, uh, it has revealed that's where the hacking mechanism is. That's that brass part that's sitting there. That, that right there, the, the job of that is actually to reach out and just touch the balance wheel so that it stops it from moving while you're setting the hand so that you can set it to exactly the right second. All right, I can remove once again the, uh, get down, there we go, uh, the crown and the stem, and that lets me move remove the winding clutch, or the sliding clutch, excuse me, and the clutch wheel. And that's everything on this side, so flip the movement back over. Yeah, we're not done yet. This This is a... <laughs> Hmm, <laughs> what have I bitten off here? Um, as you can see, that pile is really starting to grow. 
And I'm still not done even disassembling this thing. But none of the things that I've seen so far are outside of my comfort zone. Nothing that I haven't uh, dealt with before on some level, though this is, I think, the first time I've ever worked on a GMT watch. So there, there are a few extra parts here that I have to contend with. Okay, can take out the uh, setting lever now. As we dig ever deeper into this movement, are you getting nervous? <laughs> Don't be nervous. We'll figure it out. One of the cool things about this hobby, by the way, when it's not your full-time job, is that a lot of times time is the big constraint, right? If you're working on a job, you have to get it back to the customer quickly. And also like the quicker you can finish a job, the quicker you can get to the next one. But that's not what this is for me. I love making videos for you to watch. I love working on watches, but you know, these are volunteer projects for the most part. So, you know, I'm not, I don't have to put a ton of pressure on myself to be really fast. If I get stuck, I can just sort it out, right? If, you know, I'm making a video here. If I get stuck on a part when I'm putting it back together and I just cannot figure out how it goes together, I can take the time to fire up the video that I took from before and figure out how it works in my head. I can, I can write a little drawing of it on a piece of paper. I can do all that stuff. And you know, when you take away that time constraint and say, yeah, it might take me three days, but I'm going to get this thing back together. Then you don't feel that pressure quite as much. And by the way, after you've been doing this for a while, like I have, it doesn't take three days. You, you actually can start to figure it out a lot more quickly than you think. All right, we'll take off the, the winding rotor. That's the weight that actually gets tossed around. And that leaves, uh, just, the automatic works here. And that's a kind of a two plate setup, similar to the main one, just a lot smaller plate, three wheels in between, and then another plate. So there's the top plate coming off again, jeweled, jeweled, jeweled. You can see them all over the place on this movement. I love that. Not only is it a great bearing surface, as I mentioned, it's also like, like second hardest on the hardness scale or something. And that means that they just last forever. Like they're brittle, they can crack, so you have to prevent that, but they don't deteriorate in any re meaningful way. Okay, take out the reversing wheels, and there's this little gear in the middle still. Oops. And I keep dropping stuff in the holes of my little staking plate here, but that's fine, that they just fall down to the bench, right? Somewhere on the bench. All right, there it is, that's the rest of that, and there it is. Whew, almost done taking this thing apart. First though, we should put the uh, balance back on so that when I put the watch through the watch cleaning machine, it uh, is stable and protected. Okay, and now the last thing we need to do is just take apart the barrel, which houses the mainspring. So that's kind of the next step here to finishing up our disassembly. And there we go. Oh, careful, careful, careful. There we go. Okay. And now I can just walk the mainspring out by hand. And there we go. Mainspring looks like it's in really good shape still as well. This watch, all told, hasn't really been used that much. So hopefully just a good cleaning and regulation and we can get this thing running perfect for my friend. So now we can put all the parts into the little cleaning baskets. I've got a few different sizes here, the little ones for the little parts and then a bigger basket to hold the bigger stuff so that we can put this thing through the cleaning machine, which will remove any residue, dirt, oil, anything, and get it absolutely perfectly clean. This is the machine here. It's pretty clearly a vintage machine. They do still make them, you can buy a new one. In fact, they make automatic ones that will do all a lot of this motion for you. But for somebody like me, who's not doing a high volume of movement cleaning, this is perfectly adequate. In fact, it's actually really sweet to use. It just has these cool old switches and lights on it and stuff, and I love it. So with that, as the watch gets clean, I didn't wanna mention, I have a Patreon for this channel. If you wanna support me, if you like what I'm doing here on the channel and you'd like to get a wristwatch revival 
uh, thank you card and sticker in the mail, which every level gets, by the way. You can check out patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. I'll put a link to it down in the description. And I just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody who supports me on this channel. It really does mean the world to me, and I truly appreciate it. Okay, so we're just gonna clean up this uh, bracelet and the case here in the ultrasonic cleaner. Ultrasonic cleaner is a really important tool to have. Um, it can serve as your watch cleaning machine when you're a hobbyist. And then after you transition away, you still need it for stuff like this because there's still some dirt and buildup and debris. And you wanna do that on bracelets like, ah, there we go, uh, on bracelets like this because the dirt in between can actually produce wear over time and cause your bracelet to become loose where the links get loose and it kind of jingle jangles. You don't want that. Um, and putting it through a cleaner like this can really, really help. It's also, you know, non-abrasive, which is nice too, because I do want to keep this uh, pretty clean to how it was when he got it. Now take a look at the movement all torn apart. My goodness sakes, there's a lot of parts in one of these things. I think when I started taking it apart, I didn't quite fully recognize how much extra complexity the GMT added, but uh, in for a penny, as they say, we are off here. So let's get this thing back together and see if we can't get it running tip top for my friend. The first thing we need to do here, since this is an automatic watch, is put some braking grease around the inside wall of the barrel. Now, this is a special type of grease where the mainspring can actually slide along it, but not too much. Because if you think about it, when you wind up a, a regular watch with your hand, it stops, right? At some point you go, oh, it's fully wound up and you can't wind it anymore. But what happens on an automatic watch? Because it winds up when you move your arm. So if you just move in your arm all day, it's going to get fully wound up. Well, what happens is it actually just slides gently along the wall when it needs to. And this braking grease um, keeps it at that exact right tension. I'm going to use a different type of grease. This is for mainsprings. And I'm just going to run my fingers along the length of the mainspring with the grease on it. And what that does is just prevent any corrosion or sticking without being too overly done. Sometimes people to put too much lubrication on the mainspring and then it seems to get like attract dirt and dust and stuff. Yeah, I don't think that that's really necessary. So just a thin layer is good. Now I'm using my uh, mainspring winders and my absolute favorite part. Oh, it's, yeah. You know, the, the, it's like you got to rank them, right? Like when the balance wheel kicks back up, that's probably number one. But this, when, when you put the mainspring in with the mainspring winders, that clicking sound and then having everything just be contained in that barrel, it is nice. I absolutely love it. Um, there's other ones that are harder to describe. The smell of the watch parts after they're done with the watch cleaning machine. <laughs> Can't really show you that on here, but uh, it has a very distinct smell that's, it's good. It, it's kind of a chemically clean smell, I guess. I don't know how to put it, but uh, I also enjoy that. It's probably not good for me. <laughs> All right, now we can put the uh, barrel back together. And before we start uh, reassembling the movement, I'm gonna take off the, uh, the balance here. Once again, there's a lot of extra steps done just to protect the balance because it happens to be so fragile. Just one slip of a screwdriver can really damage it and it's expensive and really not where you want to be. So it's just makes more sense to take it off. Okay. So with the barrel complete in, we can start reassembly and there's a little tiny bridge that goes here that I believe is for the 24 hour hand for that, for the extra hour hand. I think that's what that does. Suppose I didn't really research that out, but I think that's what it does. At any rate, um, it does, I do know it needs to go there. And uh, so we'll be tacking that down. A Little bit of lubrication in there too. Now we can start putting in the train of wheels. This one is the escape wheel. You can always tell the escape wheel because it's silver and because it has way different teeth on it than any of the other wheels. Once again, a little bit of lubrication. Generally speaking, we use three different types when reassembling this part of the watch. Kind of light, medium, and heavy. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Okay, got that all set. And now well, we can throw on the train wheel bridge once I get it lined up. 
this is often a very tricky operation. I'm going to use this stick to kind of give me a little bit of downward pressure. And I do mean a little, oh, did you see that? It just fell perfectly into place. See, this is what I'm talking about when I say that Rolex knows how to make a movement. Like this is my first time working on that movement and it just fell into place. Like th that can be a 12 minute operation of tweaking and, you know, getting it fine. Cause you, you have to be so gentle. You can't just start screwing things down or you'll snap a pivot. And this thing just fell into, it's beautiful. It's that type of engineering that you really can only appreciate when you start working on it. Right. You know, you, you can come up to me and tell me that your car has an amazing engine and it was really well thought out and all that stuff. But if I go to your auto mechanic who actually works on it, then I'll know, right? If they say, oh no, they really thought this out. They knew, you know, that the mechanic couldn't get to this part. So they did, they moved it over here and, you know, to really show that kind of holistic viewpoint on it. And they certainly have that here. And you can see that things are moving quite freely here with the barrel and the train, train wheel. So we'll go ahead and put on this. I think I called it the crown wheel bridge or something. Crown bridge. I don't know. I'll have to look up if, if there's a specific name for it. Again, it's unique to Rolex. Other watch brands don't have it, but I can just put that on. I'm going to use a little bit of medium viscosity oil here to set up for the, uh, for the next wheel here. This is that kind of intermediate wheel. If you see red grease, that means that it is that intermediate level. It's for things that are, you know, under a decent amount of load, but not a ton. That's when we tend to use that. Okay, and now we can screw that part down as well. Yeah, it's not just about the materials, it turns out, when it comes to uh, watch movements. In fact, most watch movements um, share similar materials. You know, brass, steel, that kind of stuff. Ooh, that does not, yeah, there we go. See, that's a good example. I was putting that in upside down, but I didn't recognize it right away, but then it just didn't feel right because it looked too plain, right? And this is like, again, where you see that sunburst pattern on there. And it's like, that actually does serve a function as well. And by the way, that just reminded me, <laughs> I forgot a part. So on this crown wheel bridge, remember how the hack was underneath it? I did not replace the hack. And I'm like, okay, I, I let's make sure that we do this before we move forward with the build, because I don't want to get too deep into this thing and then recognize that I forgot that. That is an important piece, even though it's a super thin, just piece of brass, you know, that's a function of that not all watches have. If you go buy a mechanical watch and you pull out the crown, it might stop the watch running or it might not. It depends on if your watch has a hacking function. But if I don't replace that, the watch will run. Nothing will be wrong with it. You wouldn't even know until you pulled out the, the crown and then the watch didn't stop. And you would say, wait a minute, this is supposed to stop. But I got that back in, replaced that bridge, and now we can continue with getting this uh, ratchet wheel in place. I'm just gonna kind of secure it with the stick so that I can tighten it down. And flipping the movement over, I can continue by uh, putting together the keyless works. So we'll start with the clutch wheel and the sliding clutch. Now you see I've switched over to blue. Remember I told you that the oil was red? This is blue, that's grease. That's actually a thicker compound that's used for parts that are under a pretty decent amount of load and are metal on metal. Back to the red, you can see I've got it in those little cups. That prevents any type of dust or debris from get contaminating the oil. You also have to switch out your oil pretty regularly. Okay, now we can put the yoke in place and a little bit of grease as well. I'm gonna put it on this post. This is where we're gonna be putting on actually a couple of parts and I'll get a little bit of a head start here as well and put a little bit of the grease along the edge of the yoke because that's where a spring will be touching it. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that spring in now. It's called the yoke spring. 
trying to stabilize it and then there we go. Ooh, don't don't jump. Don't. Okay, I Yoke Springs born to fly. I'm telling you if Yoke Springs could get a tattoo, it, it would say born to fly because those things jump. And they can go far too cuz those are not really thin springs, they're actually like relatively thick. I'll tell you I've been uh I I got the old flashlight and magnet out for a, for Yoke Springs in my day, I'll tell you that. Okay. Continuing with the Keyless Works build, there's a couple of little intermediate wheels for the uh, for the minute hand and the hour hand. Those transfer that turning motion of the crown up to those. It's called the motion works, the, the part that controls the hands themselves. And this one has a fairly complex motion works because it is a GMT watch. So it's not just hours, minutes, and seconds. It's also a second hour hand in there. I can put on the uh, cannon pinion now. And the minute wheel. That did not seem to sit right though, did it? No, what is, there we go. Just had to work it a little bit. And then there's this sort of elaborate color cover plate that goes over all of the keyless works here to kind of finish it off. It's even geared. It's got a gear, a wheel built into it. And we'll get that tightened down. All right, good, yep, okay. That's doing what I hope it's gonna do. And that means that I can continue with the Keyless Works build here now and move to the setting lever. Gonna use a little bit of grease on this, the blue grease that I mentioned before. Again, because it's metal on metal and it kind of gets tossed around a fair bit too. There we go. And now there's a spring actually. This doesn't look like a spring, it kind of looks more like a plate, but that's actually a spring. Because again, Rolex kind of does it their own way, although in this case, many brands do it this way. I wouldn't say the majority, but they use a spring-loaded mechanism on the setting lever. That's why when I took out the crown and the stem at the very beginning, I pushed down with my tweezers on a little button and that released it. Sometimes that's a screw. So most brands, I would say, use a screw down method where you unscrew a little screw and then you can pull that out. But Rolex and many other brands uh, choose to use a spring loaded method. Now the setting lever spring can go into place as well. I have to make sure that it's engaged properly before I tighten it down all the way so that I don't break it. Like that. And now I can put this crazy hour wheel on here. This actually contains a lot of what's going on with the jumping hours. It, it's kind of boat, sorry, not jumping hours, the uh, ability to set the time in hour increments. Jumping hours is actually a different thing. Um, but uh, so it's kind of nice because it's all contained in that one part. And speaking of that one part, I put it in place a little too early. <laughs> I'm trying to put this calendar jumper wheel into place and uh, it would not fit. So I need to take out the other stuff. That happens, some, especially on a brand new movement to me, like one I've never worked on. So now I've got a bit of a tricky operation here. I need to move this spring back so I can move this arm, replace the jewel on the arm, and then let the tension of the spring press that jewel up against the cam, which is that sort of oddly shaped top part. Here's a little jewel. Pull this back. Careful, this is a... <laughs> This is under a significant amount of tension and I do not need things to be flying away. Okay, that's in place. Am I gonna let go? Ooh, okay, don't fly away. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm just gonna keep one, <laughs> one hand on this thing until I know that it's tied down or, or screwed down, I should say, because if it jumps, we could be looking at that little jewel flying away, which I'm never gonna find, and the arm and or spring could also take a, take a leap on us. So this is a little bit of a tense moment for the rebuild. Whew. Okay, with that tightened down, I can finally let go 
of that tension and know that things will actually just stay in place. And I can go ahead and re-replace the, uh, the parts that I had put on there a little bit prematurely. And then there's this little intermediary between these two that I need to make sure is in place. This basically tells the, as the watch turns and tells time, that turns, which then turns the uh, calendar wheel very slowly. Okay, and now we can put this big calendar wheel cover plate on as well. I do need to make sure that everything's lined up before I secure it down because there is a pivot in there and I, I don't wanna tighten it down, so I just need to tweak around with this a little bit until it really sits flush. And I feel comfortable about that. Good, that looks right. And now I can start tacking it down. And as I mentioned before, just another nice little touch here from Rolex. They use these blued screws to tighten these down so that I can remember quite easily, oh, it's the blued ones. Okay, flipping the movement back over. And get to a little moment of truth about how this thing is going to run. Put in the pallet fork first, and then the pallet fork bridge. Another little Rolex thing, pallet fork bridge has these two notches built into it. That's what the pallet fork bumps up against side to side. On most watch movements, there's posts that are put into the plate of the watch itself that act as that purpose, but Rolex has a pretty slick little design, and they're also not unique in that either. That is a fairly common thing, but it is not the common thing. They integrated it into the bridge. So the pallet fork bumps up against the sides of that rather than some dedicated posts. Okay, here we go. Balance wheel coming in. And let's see. If it'll run, oh, whoo. Boom, just a little bump and the thing's off and running. It doesn't even have a full wind yet. There we go, beautiful. Boy, I could get used to working on these. Um, it's running again, but we don't know how well yet, right? And you know, I'm, I expected it to run. I hoped it would run, but I gotta tell you, it just came right together. All right, so we'll tighten down that bridge and now we've got ourselves a running Rolex. So we'll put it on the microscope here and start to oil the jewels. As you can see, I'm using the same types of oils. This is our lightest viscosity and I'm really just trying to use the proper amount. It can be tempting to fill up that inner cup with oil, but that's not actually the best way to do it. And it's just a skill that you have to practice and work on over time. Now I can take off the shock setting that's on the top of this, uh, balance. I've also stopped the balance using the hack, which is kind of a nice little feature. And this is two parts that sit on the top. There's a cap jewel and a setting and I need to separate them, clean them, re-lubricate them, then replace them. So there they are currently together. But once I put them in the uh, cleaning solution here, they separate out and here's what it looks like when it's done. That's the cap jewel. And what I need to do is put a drop of oil uh, on the cap jewel here. Yeah, just like that. And then I can grab the other part of it, that's the uh, setting here, and stick it on top. And if I flip it over, the oil gets suspended in between the two, and now I can replace it back into the movement. These are very, very finicky to work with, but once you get used to them, they're actually not super bad. You do find that dragging across works better than pushing on springs, pulling rather than pushing, and a little bit more oiling to do. Now we can put it back on the time grapher and let's see how it's running. Okay, with a full wind, you can see it's about 12, 14 seconds a day off, but the amplitude's up nicely to 246. And let's take a look at what we're working with here because you might be thinking, well, let's just regulate it, right? Well, where's the little arm on the top that has the plus and the minus that you just sort of push to regulate? Rolex doesn't use them. It's another Rolex thing where they have what's called a free sp sprung balance. There's nothing hindering it. You can't change the length of that spring. So what you have to do instead, take a look at the outside of the wheel here. Do you see those screws? See that one with the weird ridges on it right there? Those are how you regulate it. Take a closer look and you'll see that it's a sort of a star-shaped pattern on that screw. Those are weights. 
That's what they are. And as you turn them, they change the rate at which the wheel spins. Now you might be thinking, how do you actually do that? Well, I've got a tool for that. And here it is, it's called a MicroStella tool. It's a weird looking little tool, but I'll show you how it works. It allows you to turn those screws. Do you see the end of the MicroStella tool, how it has a star pattern? And do you see the top, how there's a red line and then there's demarcations as you go? Every little demarcation that you turn changes it by a second, basically, or a tenth of a second or something like that, a, a, an increment that you know. And this is what you do. You take the MicroStella wrench and you carefully, careful, be careful, care, there we go, get it engaged, and then it allows you to turn it a very specific amount. So here I'm gonna turn it seven seconds or something like that, as much as it will let me. And now I have to do that on the other side, the opposite side, they, there's four screws on here. There's two bigger ones and two smaller ones. And I can pick which ones I turn and it'll uh, change the timing differently. So the bigger ones change the timing more dramatically and the smaller ones uh, do it less so. And the way this works is like, imagine a figure skater, when they're spinning, if they pull their arms in, they spin faster. If they put their arms out, they spin slower. And it's the same idea here. If I want the watch to go faster, I turn it such that the weights are closer to the middle. And if I need it to go slower, I do the opposite. So now that it's been regulated, let's put it on and see what we've got. Okay, not bad. We're at plus five seconds a day now and everything else looks the same. But that's not good enough. So let's go back again and make some fine adjustments here with our microcella tool. And I'm gonna show you once again, and this is just the name of the game with watchmaking. You know, you gotta have some patience and sometimes, you know, do adjustments a little bit at a time. So I'm gonna adjust one of the weights and I'm gonna use my tweezers to gently move the balance wheel over so that I have access to the other weight. And I'm trying to do it exactly the same on both. And thankfully there's the markings on the top of the microcella tool that will allow me to do that. Okay, and now that we've got another adjustment in, now let's see how the watch is doing. Woo, plus two seconds a day, not too shabby, but you know what? Let's just do it one more time, right? I mean, what else do I gotta do? We can just do another quick tweak. I'll just sort of skip you through it here so you don't have to watch the same thing over. And now let's see what it's doing plus one and or zero seconds a day. That is fantastic, but the beat error is still off. And as you can see, there is an adjuster screw on the top here, that is for beat error. And so all I need to do is loosen it, tweak it around and get it just right. And after doing so, beautiful. Plus one second a day is where it settles down. Zero beat error, 250 degrees of amplitude. And I'm calling that good. I am thrilled with that. We got this thing running wonderfully. Now we need to turn our attention to the bracelet though. Taking a look at the bracelet, you can see that my friend's worn it a bit. It's in pretty good shape though overall. So we'll take it apart. This is of course already been put through the ultrasonic cleaner as well. So this is kind of you know, where we're at with the bracelet as far as like what good a condition it's in and that type of thing. Now, I don't really feel like polishing this whole thing and refinishing it because it's actually still in pretty decent shape. And my friend didn't really want to do that either. So I'm gonna use what's become kind of my go-to for polishing jobs that aren't quite as extreme as like a full refinish, it's called Flitz. And it's like a chemical polish basically, it's a non-abrasive, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't like sand or take away material from it, but it does a really good job of smoothing out minor abrasions and scratches for jobs you know, like this, where my friend doesn't want the full restoration done on the bracelet and he's gonna be wearing this watch, at least if I have it my way. And so it's not, you know, like a, it's not like a collection piece, it's more like a watch to wear. And uh, let's see how good we can get the bracelet working just off, uh, looking, excuse me, just off of flits. Look at that. It's nice, right? Like, sure, it doesn't take off all the little dings and stuff. That would require a full, you know, bench polish, but that is so much better than it looks now and it really brings that luster back to it. And for the type of job like this, I think that that is exactly where you wanna be. And I'm really happy with the way that uh, this bracelet looks now. And I can also put it back through the ultrasonic just to get any little bits 
that may be uh, left on there too. And I think this thing's gonna look absolutely beautiful. I'm gonna do the same thing to the watch case here. Now we haven't quite finished reassembling the movement. I know you thought it was all done, but remember the automatic winding work still needs to be reassembled as well before we can fully put this watch back together and get it back on my friend's wrist. So there you go. Couple of wheels. These are called reversing wheels. They allow the watch to be wound whether that rotor is moving forwards or backwards, like counterclockwise or clockwise. Okay, so it's coming back together. And now we can put the, uh, the top of the sandwich. Does that work for you? That's kind of how I see it. I think I tend to view the world through the lens of sandwiches sometimes. I don't, it's probably not, <laughs> not the best way to do it. Little bit of light viscosity oil here on the top. And now we can continue with the calendar rebuild. So of course that does mean that we need to put this calendar ring back in that's gonna actually tell us what the day of the month is. And that just means moving the little tensioner on there out of the way and now there's also this little clip that kind of moves back over to hold it in place as well. And let's just make sure it's working. Boom, clicks right over. That's exactly what we want to see. And once again, yeah, that looks just about right to me. Okay, now we can replace the dial. The dial on this watch is gorgeous. It's in perfect shape and it's this beautiful kind of lacquered look it might even just be lacquered i'm not actually sure but it is lovely and of course it's going to need the hands to go back on as well so i'll start by putting on the hour hand just like that and now we can put on the other hour hand, but that's also after making sure that we lined up everything with the calendar properly, because if your watch um, doesn't have a calendar, you can you know, put the hour hand on wherever, and it doesn't really matter as long as it's lined up with the other hands, that's good enough. But with a calendar watch, you want it to turn, you want the calendar to actually turn over at you know around midnight. And you know, ideally close to midnight. And if, if you don't do that, well, then of course it'll just turn over in the middle of the day and it won't work properly for the user, right? So you just need to make sure that you uh, pay some attention to that. And I have done that here. Okay, and check that out. We got the second hand on as well and it's running. Handset looks beautiful. Dial looks beautiful. Everything's all set up, which means of course that we can now recase the movement. And once again, being a Rolex, we put it in kind of crooked and then turn it into place, and then we can tighten it down using the screws, the case screws. Can't forget this, by the way. Okay, and now I've got a new gasket here as well, just in case the old one was getting maybe a little bit brittle. And I can rub it in this cleaner. That th This is a sponge that has like a, a silicone grease on it. And it rubs up against it to kind of clean and prep the, uh, the gasket properly. And also leaves a thin layer of that grease on it, which helps with waterproofness as well as uh, installation. Okay, putting on the... Uh, the, uh, the automatic winding works here is one of the very last steps. As you can see, it's working well. The gears are turning, which means that it's actually winding up the watch. Make sure we get this uh, gasket seated properly before I put on the case back once again. It still has that sticker on it. And take a look at this watch. Isn't this thing gorgeous? It's a really distinct look, right? They don't, you know, two-tone watches aren't very popular these days, although they're making a little bit of a comeback. But this one kind of really owns it and it has a really nice overall kind of impact, I think. I think it's just a, a cool look. Let's get the bracelet installed back on this watch. And with that, we will be finished 
it's running beautifully. It's looking good. And I just got to get my buddy to wear this thing a little bit more often because it looks so cool. And take a look at it. What a lovely watch, huh? A Rolex GMT Master II from the early 2000s in two-tone that's now running and looking great. And I'm really happy with it. And I hope he will be as well. Thank you so much for hanging out with me uh, for this servicing light restoration here on this uh, GMT2. This is one of my favorite watch models and uh, it was really fun for you to join me. And I really appreciate it. If you want to find me on Instagram, I do post uh, kind of in between project updates and stuff like that over there. It's uh, wristwatch underscore revival. And uh, I just wanted to reiterate my thanks to you for hanging out. It really does mean the world to me that you spend some time on my, my hobby of watchmaking, and I'm glad you're here. We'll see you next time.